Uh, thanks so much, Will. I think you put an awful lot of uh, interesting ideas uh, on the table. And so what we now have is an opportunity over the course of the next uh, you know, hour to uh, uh, ask questions, to comment, and uh, I would welcome uh, suggestions. I know a number of you are, are very familiar with the topic, others less so. Uh, after you want to start? Yeah. You want to introduce yourself for everybody I'm, here? I'm Abner Cohen. I'm a professor here and senior fellow at Um I always felt that the number, the big number of participants was just too much. And I always felt that there is a need to have a serious forum for head of states. It doesn't have to be met you know, in a regular fashion, <coughs> but to talk about issue beyond just questions, current issue of security, but also talking about the future, the future of nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. And those should be the eight de facto and de jure nuclear weapon states, plus the advanced uh, nuclear nuclear states. And I thought that the there was a certain tension between the fact that there was almost 50 states which didn't allow to have an intimate conversation and understanding, even at the heuristic level, and I wonder if, among your recommendations, you try to, because I think that the for, informal goal for head of states, for example, the whole thing about the disarmament agenda of President Obama, one of the reasons why it's told is that there was never a sense of some kind of architecture, some kind of bonding and effort to create a world coalition to discuss these issues. Um, so, so, you know, one of the things to think about it is a smaller, number of participants and to allow some kind of conversation in formal fashion between advanced nuclear weapon states. And I wonder to what extent you address that kind of issue. So you really raised two points, the size of the meeting and the agenda of the meeting. Um, on the size of the meeting, I agree. Um, it, I think they were, they did as, as good a job as they possibly could be expected to, to have done. Um, with scenario-based discussions to have actually constructive discussions among four dozen people. That's a hard thing to do. And I think a smaller group probably would be a good idea. And that's why I turned to the G20 as a mechanism that's already in place. I think the G20 numbers and your numbers would not be that different, actually, if, if I understood you correctly. I mean, you had eight plus. And the plus would probably take a, you know, be drawn from essentially that same group. Um, on the agenda, I think the Obama administration was smart to make the nuclear security summit single purpose. If they got into either nonproliferation or arms control agendas, those get so controversial so fast that um, it would actually, I think, impede progress. And you would see states, and you saw some states actually trying to do this, um, make trade-offs or demand trade-offs between those two things. And I, for one, at least believe that nuclear security is of such surpassing importance and is so universally important that encouraging states to make trade-offs or demand trade-offs with other agendas is, is not important. <coughs> That doesn't mean that there shouldn't be another forum to discuss the, yeah. the arms Just control. Just a quick follow-up. I mean, you can talk about formal agenda, which is primarily security, and informal <coughs> agenda, a way for the leaders to get to know each other in some informal fashion, you know, catch your house uh, rules and, and so forth, just, just to allow, not bargaining, but more to understand how they feel about it. Sure. I, don't, I think that makes sense. Yeah, you, you want to... uh, kind of picking up on uh, what you already discussed, I think uh, I, would, uh, I would agree with uh, uh, Amr that probably a smaller group would have been uh, better because what it in fact uh, became is something in the middle. Not really a universal uh, body, but uh, not really the uh, very focused group. And uh, one of the problems that uh, it uh, kind of entails and what we will be dealing with the, after the summit process is the legitimacy of all the uh, kind of good ideas and decisions that came out of the mm -hmm. time. Because the countries that were outside of the process, uh, and you know it from the even discussions within the IAEA at the general conference, they don't even want to mention nuclear security summit in the nuclear security resolution because it's like we were not part of it. 
Um, so that creates that legitimacy deficit for mm -hmm. this whole process. Mm -hmm. And it would be difficult, from what I see, to implement some really good ideas that came out of it, just because countries felt that they were excluded. Then the, on the agenda uh, and why it's focused, it, it's always a dilemma whether focused too narrow or too broad. But in many countries' views, uh, uh, the birth of the uh, summit process came uh, to some degree from the Obama's Prague speech. And the Prague speech was focused on a much, much broader agenda, including disarmament, global zero, and, and, and arms control, and everything else. And uh, I remember the first summit and the, the second one, many of the comments even coming from the leaders were on this broad Obama agenda, yeah. not on the nuclear security. So, so it became uh, a larger promise that then uh, was really narrowed down. Maybe the US had that intent from the very beginning, but in the world view, it was seen as a, uh, a little bit of a manipulation and not really delivering on the entire package. So that, that I've heard of many comments from that. That's why many countries started bringing it up, and but too much nuclear security. We haven't discussed these, these big other issues, particularly on this government. I fully agree with your comments regarding the military materials being kind of excluded and uh, not really dealt with. And I, I don't know, uh, uh, there is not much of appetite to deal with these issues nowadays. And what I just wanted to hear from you is like maybe some ideas what you think could be done in this uh, and uh, maybe one more point before we move to the nuclear materials, uh, military materials, is on the uh, Russia's kind of a decision to leave and um, not participate in some of them. Well, you know, they also didn't like the nuclear security summit from the very beginning and uh, um, basically used whatever the excuse came by to walk out when they. Um, relationships or went sour. But uh, they did have, and many countries quietly actually also supported their view about that this whole idea of the last summit process to look at other international organizations and see what they can do in this area. They saw it as really kind of an encroachment on the uh, um, of these international organizations and trying to expand their mandate this kind of de facto rather than uh, through the normal kind of functioning of these organizations and their bodies. So um, that was just a comment on, on that particular. Thanks. I'm going to hold my, my fire for the moment and call upon <laughs> others. Uh, I would just, um, just one comment on, on what you said because I think I've, yeah. you know, some of the answers what I've already said um, is how do you deal with the military? Right. Um, I would argue that my proposal for a P3, P5 uh, empirically based standards <coughs> would, would cover military stocks. Now it wouldn't necessarily have to be defined as covering military stocks, but remember you're talking about the P3 and the P5. There's a reason why they're, they have primacy there, because they are the nuclear weapon states under the, under the, the non-proliferation treaty. Yeah, but then what do you do with the other ones that are outside first? Uh, and, uh, then, so they develop the standards, and then they go and the they discuss them with the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, so my guess is that India and Pakistan would, would love to be able to talk to the P5 about these things. Yeah, Not true. necessarily because they're in love with, with taking recommendations on nuclear security, but because it places them at the right table. Which is precisely why you have to be careful because you then convey <laughs> a nuclear weapon status on countries which are not part of the NPT. I agree. Uh, please. Uh, yes. Well, just on um, countries that demand trade-offs, uh, do you do you see any hope with uh, negotiations over Pilindaba, perhaps in the future? Over Pilindaba? Yeah. Because uh, the stocks are substantial, according to estimates. Do you know what Pilindaba means? <laughs> yeah. We can. It actually means the conversation is closed. <laughs> <laughs> it's an aptly named Very facility. Well <laughs> that may be my answer. It's not my hope, but that's... 
I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it, it relates to the, the point that Will made earlier about the, um, the role that President Obama uh, played in attracting participants to this initial security <coughs> summit, which was not really thought of as a process at the time. It was a you know a one-off event in the minds of, of many. But for the South Africans and the Egyptians, who had been very critical of prior U.S. efforts to kind of raise uh, things such as ATU minimization, uh, I think it really was deference to the president that they came to the, to the table. Uh, and the South Africans will tell you this, you know, directly as will the as will the Egyptians. Um, and so, you know, having them present. Uh, and they might not otherwise have been under kind of you know Abner's you know schema was was significant uh, because you you did I think uh, raise the salience of the issue of nuclear security in a fashion where uh, rather than just thinking of this as a problem for the nuclear weapon states, nuclear security became a, a problem uh, that was accepted as a problem by all of the participants in in, in the meeting. I mean, the other thing, which I, I think Will didn't mention, which, which I found you know, particularly intriguing, was that you had, particularly in the Middle East, countries like Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Egypt, and the UAE sitting down at the table among the Sherpas uh, in the negotiations of the communique and the work plan. Uh, I mean, these were negotiations with countries that often are not prepared to sit down and to talk. So that, I think, in and of itself was, was you know, quite, uh, quite consequential. Uh, Jeff, you had a question? Yeah. Um, I think I also want to join in on this discussion about the uh, size of the um, summit and, and somewhat disagree with my esteemed colleagues, uh, Abner and Yelena. I'm, I'm Jeff Knopf. I'm the chair of our um, MA program in Nonproliferation and Terrorism Studies here. Um, so uh, I completely agreed with everything you had to say, so I'm not going to pick any disagreements <laughs> with it. Um, but I'm going to propose print in a little bit larger context. Uh, I, I ran a project which was published as an edited volume at the beginning of the year this year on um, kind of trends in global cooperation on nonproliferation. There was a, a one of the case study chapters was the Nuclear Security Summit, uh, Libby Turpin. Uh, wrote it, it was published before the 2016 summit. Um, but the when you look sort of across the board, um, there is a broader pattern that's uh, a sort of a, um, kind of on the one hand, on the other hand kind of thing. So on the, on the one hand, there seems to be this steady expansion of cooperation in the sense that we get more and more new initiatives, of which the nuclear security summits are, are just one. and the trend over time is for the number of countries participating in these various initiatives also to, to grow and, and the goal to be to bring as many people into the tent as possible. Um, but on the other hand, the, the, the format for cooperation is sort of changing and there's a lot less commitment to um, you know, negotiating global treaties and setting up new formal international organizations. And so we have this kind of hybrid model now that's sort of you know, more than coalitions of the willing, less than formal global you know, multilateral institution. And that seems to be a very broad pattern with a lot of drivers, but I see the nuclear security summits as having happened um, in part because it kind of just fits that, that bigger trend. Um, but also with a also being a little bit of pushback against that trend in that it's, it was at the head of state level, which is now unusual. Um, and that there was some commitment to breathing new life into some of the formal instruments like the, the convention. Um, but I think it was, you know, a sort of part and parcel of a larger trend in the regime. And, and one final point, and I'll stop. Um, you know, one of the big sort of takeaway observations from the big project was that um, this trend seems to be um, giving greater weight over time to the role of kind of relationships that happen more at the working level. And one of your observations about the aftermath from the 2016 summit, um, I'm, apart from the fact that I think it's sort of good for nuclear security, I'm kind of happy because my hypothesis is sort of validated here that this contact group, right, sort of, we can't sustain this at the summit level, but at least the Sherpas will sort of still talk to each other. It's kind of consistent with another observation that came out of that project. I guess in the theory of summit leaders, this uh, metaphor that's used about the iceberg, that 
the you see the summit, but there's a lot going right. on that you don't see. And I actually think uh, it's it's actually more like um, and is it Mauna Kea? The, so Everest is the tallest mountain in the world, uh, measured from sort of base to from land base to peak. But I think it's Mauna Kea in Hawaii is the tallest mountain in the world, measured from the bed of the the sea. And you've actually got it's 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 not like the desolate uh, territory that surrounds um, Everest. It's more like the Hawaiian mountain that's surrounded by reefs with coral and fish and lots of sea life and and that stuff is really important. I've been to the top of Mauna Kea and I highly recommend it. <laughs> I'd rather snorkel at the bottom. You can do that fun. <laughs> Other questions. We encourage our, our uh, students and uh, younger uh, staff to, uh, to raise questions as well. Uh, as you think of them, let me uh, turn the floor back to you, Lynn. Yeah, you know, I can spend an hour with as well <laughs> discussing certain things. Uh, I was uh, interested in your comments about the Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism, which you said in its founding documents excludes civilian... Uh, excludes military. Excludes military, specifically. Um, is there, there a way to look at the founding documents? It's online in the State Department site, the terms of reference. Oh. Okay, but the, because of one of the uh, recommendations uh, I'm working with uh, uh, IISS with Mark Fitzpatrick on uh, a study on what can be done in terms of securing military materials. And one of our recommendations was that, you know, even the, uh, the initiative focuses on the civilian. Uh, at least we could invite some military as observers to uh, participate in its um, exercises or uh, demonstrations and things like that. Would that be that founding document exclude that completely? Well, no. Um, and the reason I say no is I attended the first three or four of those meetings. And I actually attended as a representative of the National Nuclear Security Administration, which of course runs the U.S weapons program. Right. Uh, the General Verhotsev, uh, who headed the 12th GUMO at the time, Russia's uh, nuclear weapons custodians, also attended the nuclear security summits. And I am certain that maybe more anonymous, but nonetheless important nuclear weapons officials from other states also attended. So what do you think it's uh, you know because it doesn't have they don't have to deal with the military issues there uh, but at least to attend and kind of learn from what is being shared as best practices between the in the nuclear security uh, yeah i think if we frame the mm -hmm. issue as all weapons usable material should be secured to this right. point right. or <laughs> then you can yeah. draw the inference you don't have to yeah. Okay. Yeah. My impression, I mean, I, I spoke at one of the, uh, one of the global uh, initiative, initiative uh, meetings, and my recollection was uh, that uh, because of the working groups that are established, I mean, there's one on nuclear forensics, for example, I'm quite certain that there was discussion of, you know, uh, uh, weapons use mm -hmm. issues. I mean, it, it's not, I mean, it wasn't a discussion of, right. was this, uh, you know, military origin material or not, but I, I suspect there would be ways in which you could address this okay. through some of the working groups uh, if you were you know, if you were so in, in, inclined. So it's it's an interesting uh, issue to uh, to pursue further. Some other uh, some other questions, uh, uh, Michelle, and then who? Um, so one of the things you that want to introduce yourself to oh, just yeah. for I'm Michelle. I'm a student at Middlebury College, and I'm an intern this summer here. Uh, one of the things you've mentioned that was intriguing me was the idea of house gifts or gift baskets. It's something I don't know much about, um, but I was wondering if you could expand on what that is in general, but also what role that plays um, in terms of the outcomes with the summit and why you think it's important for the summit. So, as far as I know, this was a complete innovation. People may be able to cite other cases where something like this was done, but I'm I'm unaware of it. And and. I believe the origin was with the U.S. delegation. So the U.S. hosted the first nuclear security summit. 
and they encouraged, they actively encouraged other states to bring gifts, <laughs> house gifts, like you know, like a, a bunch of flowers you'd bring to your host or hostess, um, that would be related to tangible improvements of nuclear security. And then that was elaborated on in the in subsequent summits with groups of nations banding together to offer a gift basket, a more elaborate thing. And um, I think that was a very successful um, exercise. And as I say, I think it was only possible because the, dis the relative disadvantages are different from those that you would incur in other realms of, of summetry. So my, my understanding was that it was linked particularly to uh, the concern of uh, Laura Holgate, among others, with the substantial stocks of HU in Ukraine, which had been the subject for extended discussions, and it proved very difficult uh, to deal with the domestic political issues associated with those stocks of highly enriched uranium. And so I think the gift basket idea, and I may be mistaken, but I know this was part of the, the, the consideration, was a way to figure out how you could get the HU out of, out of Ukraine. And so I think uh, at least one of the, the recognized major accomplishments of the first summit was uh, the, this gift from Ukraine, which made it possible to return the HU uh, to uh, the Russian Federation, which was you know, politically very sensitive. And whether that was the, uh, the, the reason for this conception, I don't know, but I know it was a major consideration at the first summit. I'm, yeah, this is this may make the host or hostess look a little less gracious than you might expect at a normal dinner party, but they actually did ask for specific outcomes. Yeah. And by offering to publicize, uh, they could both pressure and reward states that would or would not deliver those outcomes. Now, Ukraine would be one of the notable um, uh, successes, Belarus would probably be one of the notable failures. Where they, weren't, they weren't invited either. Well, there was a back and forth about that as to whether or not they would be invited and whether or not they would actually then come forward. You may recall that, I think it was during the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, there was an agreement to remove the HEU. Um, there was then a, a decision to criticize their human rights violations and that was the end of that. For, okay. And then there was a, a back and forth in the, in the Obama administration as to whether or not Belarus would participate. Sir, so I had a question. Do you identify yourself to Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, I'm, my name is Luke. I'm also from Middlebury College. Um, so, and also an intern. Um, so I had a question about sort of the nature of the summit and the history and legacy of it as well, I guess. Um, it, it's been you know, these sort of initiatives have always been tied to a presidential administration. Do you see that as something that will continue and should continue? Or is it sort of a goal that some sort of meeting or summit will be created that is somewhat independent of, of presidential administrations? And what are the benefits, drawbacks, I guess, of, of that format? Well, up until from September 11th till this present election, Every previous candidate for the president, Republican and Democrat, has cited the threat of nuclear terrorism as being the most serious facing the United States. So that was clearly much on the minds of, of previous presidents. I th the reason I went through a little bit of the history of this was to illustrate that they've each taken a different but important approach to how to resolve this issue. Um, I think that, a, I would hope that a future president would deal with this issue. Um, I know that Secretary Clinton was involved in many of these issues because she was in office during the nuclear security summits. Um, it remains to be seen what Mr. Trump would be doing about that. I think any president is going to approach this problem looking for a unique way to put his or her signature on, on the issue. And you saw that with every previous president. And it will inevitably draw on the imperatives of the time 
and the resources of the person. So, you know, I think that President Obama's initial vast popularity was something he could easily draw upon to advance an issue he cared about. The next president's a lot less likely, whoever it is, to have that same level of, of popularity worldwide. Well, one innovation that you didn't mention, which uh, I think is particularly important, was the emphasis uh, at the first summit and subsequent summits on uh, the importance of what I would call the human factor and the emphasis on uh, nuclear security culture and education and training. Um, and so I'm kind of curious whether you share that uh, assessment, because I don't really, I, mean, I was trying to think of of other uh, kind of international uh, gatherings, uh, much less uh, you know negotiations, which had emphasized uh, this aspect uh, of culture as a as a critical factor. Um, and so I, I, I was struck, at least in the initial communique and work plan, that this was something you know, quite innovative and important, and it uh, I think. You know, carried over uh, subsequently to to the other summits, and I, I think at least particularly for uh, parties who work at you know educational institutions who are uh, you know fixated on on training, that this is something that we should also uh, uh, not lose sight of. But I'm just kind of curious whether you uh, thought that was a significant contribution of the, of the summit process. Well, I guess I would say that I regard it as fundamentally important. So I agree with that part. Um, the way you fight <coughs> complacency is a continuous commitment to excellence. And you do that through a healthy culture, right? It, or that commitment defines a healthy culture. Um, I didn't see the summit as being innovative in that regard because I think it was a par already a part of the conversation. They did advance that conversation and it was a constructive contribution because of that. Um, but I didn't see it as an innovation. That's not a criticism, sure. it's just... Yes, oh, okay, now we have uh, some hands. Uh, can we go ahead? Yeah. Start uh, just mention who you are and we'll go on. Yeah, I'm Kendra, I go to Stanford and I'm an intern here for the summer as well. And I have a question, so you touched on how President Obama was able to push this agenda because of his popularity. But now when you have delegations saying that we've talked about this topic enough, um, how do you incentivize people and countries to continue talking about nuclear security? Is it through academia publishing articles about how it's so important? Is it through world leaders using their popularity to push forward the agenda? Kind of what would that look like to continue to incentivize conversation? I think that conversation that you talk about is important. I think academia can affect the agenda. I would argue that you know the the idea of the supposed four-year lockdown you know, the, one of the agenda items of the summit was to secure all vulnerable materials within four years i would argue that we didn't actually fulfill that pledge and still probably haven't but that idea came so far as i know from um my colleague matt bunn and anthony weir who um, both had input into the campaign but also published about that idea. In fact, he came to me when I was in um, at the National Nuclear Security Administration and said, we have this idea, people should commit to this point. And I said, my reaction was, it sounds like a good idea, let me talk to uh, the people who work for me to see whether or not they think that's possible. And they said, it's a great idea, but there's no possible way we can do it. <laughs> it turned out they were right about that. <laughs> but that didn't mean that the, the push wasn't useful. And there, and I think this the idea of the undelegatable responsibility is another idea that has come from academia. So there's no doubt that uh, the academy can contribute to government policy in that regard. Um, but I don't think that that's enough. And I think that is part of why uh, the smaller group that Professor Cohen talked about um, and that I would recommend um, can help to focus it, the effort. And I think I would focus on those states with weapons usable material. Uh, I'm Amelie, I go to Brown University, and I'm a UWC research fellow for some here, and I worked on a project 
with Joy Nasser and some of her actually working with my people on, on mm -hmm. tracking the nuclear new gold project in the Middle East, the global database, according to the IEA milestone. We went through it. So I guess my question is how well equipped is the IEA to actually implement these best practices, especially in the Middle East, it seems to be a vulnerable region and what are your security concerns? And it doesn't look like any of the programs apart from the UAE program is gonna be up and going anytime soon, but I, I still, also fuel is leaves to the UAE, so it's a different situation, but I still would like to hear what you have to say about new build, or new build in general. So the first thing I should do is probably declare a, a bias or let you know of a potential conflict. I'm chairman of the board of the World Institute for Nuclear Security, which you may know um, promotes uh, and trains people on best nuclear security practices through either workshops or publications, and then also professional training and certification. The, the process for those best practices is very different from the process of Information Circular 225 run by the IAEA. That's a, you, you, I'm sure everybody here knows that it took, what, 12 years between revisions? Um, something like that. Something like that, at least. In, even after September 11th had been a part of this, where we learned that people are willing to uh, undertake suicidal attacks. And of course, when you're dealing with fissile material that was regarded earlier as self-protecting, uh, that new information is important to what security precautions you would want to undertake. So because of the IAEA's profound legitimacy and fair process, it takes a while for those standards to be developed. And they're done by uh, so a sort of top-down approach. Experts get together and negotiate what they believe to be, should be done. What's the platonic ideal of nuclear security? The, the WIMS approach is just the opposite. What are people doing and what works best in terms of either providing the best possible security for a given dollar or what will reduce your dollars for a given level of nuclear security? And so it's um, the, the process of standards versus best practices is they're very different. You know, I've written a small pamphlet about that. The best relationship that I know of, description of the relationship between the two, was done by the head of um, the, the IAEA's Division of Nuclear Security. And he said, today's best practices are tomorrow's standards. So in that regard, the two groups can work constructively together, one being more flexible, empirically based, um, responsive to immediate changes in the environment, the other one being more legitimate, um, more rigorous, and widely accepted. Jeff, I really wanted to just circle back to um, actually Kendra's question about how to keep this going with um, you know, one other observation. It, it might not be as important in nuclear security as some other areas, but in a lot of these things, um, capacity building a system can be you know, very crucial. You could have you know, two very different reasons why a state doesn't cooperate with some kind of global initiative, right? And one can be preferences. It's just not convinced that, that its interests are at stake and the problem is real. Right, but the other one is capacity. Like, oh yeah, I, I totally get that we don't want nuclear terrorism, but I'm just too poor and, and lack the, the personnel to do this myself. Can you help me? Right, and so I think that's also another way that you can keep more people engaged in the process is for the wealthier or more advanced countries to offer capacity building assistance. I agree, and that was the, the motivation that was behind the global initiative to combat nuclear terrorism. So there was recognition in the wake of the AQCon uh, network revelations that there weren't laws in place that would prevent proliferation. Malaysia had no idea that it had a nuclear proliferation <laughs> role. Um, so that led to the passage of UN Security Council Resolution 1540 that 
um, required states to enact and enforce effective export controls and gain control of the material within their boundaries and to outlaw proliferation by non-state actors. But then there was this realization that, okay, we have the law in place, but we don't have the capacity. And the global initiative to combat nuclear terrorism was the attempt to provide that capacity. I think also, you know, Jeff, I'm just going to mention some support, I think, but you know, the, the most reluctant member to support that was Pakistan uh, on the Security Council. And, it, and it's interesting when you look at the security summit process and the positive outcomes, I think many people would identify Pakistan's engagement uh, in the process and its commitment with the centers of excellence and the like. I mean, they became major players, I think, in a very positive fashion. And that's something that evolved over the course of the- Even though their the real interest was legitimacy. No. I, I'm not sure. Uh, please. Yeah. I'm Dave Lyon, retired Foreign Service officer and frequent auditor here. Uh, <laughs> a, a layman, you guys, everybody here knows more about this than I do. Quick aside, I think you mentioned bringing in, the, using our funding to bring other people in, and yet we've cut our funding in half, if I understood you correctly, from the beginning of the Bush administration. I think, I think that's just one we haven't cut it in half, but we're, we're now down below. Yeah. Of course, it speaks for itself, I guess. Yeah. The question goes back to Russia, <laughs> and I, I thought you said twice that Russia was excluded. It's my understanding Russia excluded themselves. And I guess my follow-on question from that is more along the lines, that was more of a, put it in diplomatic terms, a snit, is my take. Uh, and that it was more, you know, are they are they less interested than before? I think they would feel very vulnerable. Are they going to renew and, and even regain a sort of a leadership role in this? Uh, how do you see the next five years going along and assuming some continuity in U.S.-Russian relations? That don't... So the upside of President Obama leading at the summit was at the outset, he was so popular he could get all kinds of leaders to come to the summit. The downside was that by the time we got to the last one, President Putin didn't seem to be particularly interested in handing President Obama political victories. And therefore, your word, snip, yeah. <laughs> uh, Russia chose More not, calculated, though, sounds like. not to show up. Um, I, you know, there were, I think, um, substantive disagreements about some of this, but if it were simply a matter of substantive disagreements, they could have shown up and, and voiced those disagreements. Uh, from what I've heard at the IAEA, Russia has, uh, Russian behavior there has taken a definite turn for the worse, whereas they had always been strong supporters of the IAEA and, and been constructive in their approach. They now are obstructionist in many cases. This, even in cases where it doesn't obviously advance Russian interests. Um, this is the problem. Um, and I think part of the problem is that the nuclear security agenda is so closely identified with President Obama that Russia now is openly skeptical. And looking forward, you've got President, uh, you know, President Trump and President Putin going one way and President Clinton presumably inheriting some of the same resentment. Yeah, uh, as we saw from the WikiLeaks, and uh, you know, he's seems actively out to compared President Putin to Hitler. So my guess is that right. You know, and the other ones think he's a great guy. But anyway, yeah, thank you. But Dave, I think I mean, and uh, and Will, uh, my understanding from the conversations uh, in Moscow in which you participated, as well as some other subsequent. You know, interactions with Russian interlocutors is that while uh, there was indeed uh, you know, a strong disinclination to do anything that might be seen as reinforcing uh, President Obama's mm -hmm. agenda, uh, there also is a recognition of the importance of combating nuclear terrorism and uh, an attempt to find some way in which one can renew uh, Cooperation in the nuclear security. Well, right. I was hoping to hear. And so that's at least what, I, what I've been very clear. We haven't talked about this, but others who participated in, in the meeting in February and then in, uh, in other fora as well. So I don't think it's quite as bleak a, a picture as uh, you may have categorized, but I, I don't know what your take is. I think it waxes and wanes. So um, one of the products that my colleagues at the Belfer Center and I, together with Russians at the USA Canada Institute, was to produce a joint threat assessment of nu the nuclear terrorism threat. Um, that was something that the governments struggled with and they had trouble coming up with it for the nuclear security summit. We, we actually 
uh, I ended up briefing it to Sherpas in Thailand before the um, summit, before the last one. Um, and there was an interesting case where uh, a Russian, the lead Russian colleague and I were going to offer to brief it in, uh, in Vienna. And it was going to be hosted by the, the U.S. ambassador, but I suggested, well, maybe you could get the Russian ambassador to co-host since it's a U.S.-Russian product. And I'm told that uh, the decision, the Russians, uh, he, he, the U.S. ambassador kept getting sort of a, don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> no, not, not going to give you an answer. And then finally, uh, we learned that apparently the decision went all the way up to Lavrov not to co-host this thing that, you know, a couple of academics were presenting a paper. It wasn't exactly an earth-shaking development. Um, but that's how sensitive the Russians view these things. Now, they were very responsive in February. I think it's an open question as to whether or not they were responsive because they're trying to break the U.S. sanctions over Ukraine and show that, hey, we can do business as usual. Um, despite what you're trying to do, or because they had a genuine interest in the topics, or some combination of those two things. Sam. Uh, hi, uh, Sam Meyer, I'm a researcher here at CNS. Uh, kind of building off of that, you know, when you, when you talked about the history of uh, uh, kind of the origins of the nuclear security summits, you know, it, it goes back to the immediate post Cold War days and cooperative threat, and, uh, threat reduction and so forth. And I'm wondering if maybe having a little bit of a Cold War mentality might not be a little bit of a virtue here. <laughs> what I mean is, like in the Cold War, a lot of times you you know you had when there was an initiative in the West, you had it near uh, you know in, 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 in Eastern Bloc, you know the Lenin Prize or whatever like whatever like that. And uh, you know, and right now I wonder if you know I think there's I think the U.S. and Russia have a lot of overlapping interests in nuclear security. But it's not compelling enough of an interest for Russia to be seen as carrying, you know, the water of the United States and you know, and getting a political victory to President Obama or whatever. So, maybe is there interest in a Russian-led initiative that would mirror the NSS in any way, and might involve a different deck of nations? And um, and if there is interest, is there sort of political space for them to do that in a way that? would involve the United States, and maybe you get a different product out of it. I think that's an interesting line of thinking, mm -hmm. and you can actually trace some of the things that are being done to that sort of thinking. So the Russian, in the Russian view, and I, I don't dispute it, um, they were co-equal founders, co-founders of the Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism. It's co-chaired by Russia. Um, the uh, Sergei Kislyak, the Russian ambassador to Washington at this point, was the guy that had the lead for the Russians, and as far as I know, still re retains a fondness for the initiative. Similarly, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1540, um, if you look at the speeches that were given at the United Nations General Assembly that year, I guess it was 2003, um, both President Bush, President Bush uh, expressly proposed something like that. But President Putin put forward a proposal that arguably was very similar. And so they regard themselves as having had a hand in the origin of that idea as well. So yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for the way you're thinking. Why don't you craft something, Sam? We'll translate it into Russian and send it over <laughs> to one of our friends. Hi, my name is Julia. I'm a writer research assistant here. Uh, so talking about the 1540, uh, it seems like countries have been having quite a bit of a problem to respect deadlines uh, from the 1540 to the following resolution. Um, is there a way, do you think that uh, it would be feasible to create some, I don't know, economic sanctions to uh, let them respect some deadlines, like reports? Or, because the first step, we know it's education and training for countries that uh, don't have enough capacities, but once they have it, they should be, I mean, there should be something more legally binding, something like that. I think that gets pretty hard. Uh, I, w I was actually the author of the first draft of 1540, and 
I admit to having some trepidation when we were pursuing it. Um, the idea at the time was to try and put non, well, put proliferation in the same category of unacceptable activities as slavery or piracy, universally accepted as uh, repugnant. But it, in effect, was international legislation. It required states to enact and enforce effective export controls, to control the material, to uh, criminalize proliferation by non-state actors. So it was the passage of legislation at the UN Security Council level without you know, General Assembly. It was just the Security Council. Um, and if you then associate that legislation with sanctions, I think you're you're biting off a pretty tough yeah, no, tough path, um, and it it may also be a a realm that you know we may not want to pursue. I mean, we should think carefully about the precedential importance of doing something like that. I still think it's worthwhile doing a little bit of naming and shaming, sort of gentle sanctions, and incentivizing and capacity building. I wouldn't I wouldn't give up on those as, as outcomes. Terry. Um, Terry Newman on the CNS Advisory Board. Could you expand a little bit on the point, uh, the concept of um, holding leadership more directly responsible? Is that uh, are you talking about something more than Truman's the buck stops here? Is, are you talking about something with teeth that would make it a war crime that, for which the head of state, is this rhetoric or is there, a, is there substance? Well, I actually think rhetoric can be important. <laughs> um, so I guess the best way to illustrate my perspective on this is, is how the summit came out on this point. So in, it would be my hope that leaders would say something like, we recognize that we have, we heads of government, heads of state, have a responsibility for nuclear security that we cannot delegate. We are responsible as a part of our duties in office. Um, the United States tried to get something like that in the final statement from the summit. And it came out instead saying, leaders recognize their responsibility in this area. It was a lot weaker. Um, even getting that first statement, I think, would be a huge uh, success. And I think we should keep pressing on that. And I think the idea of incorporating this into the G20 would underscore that, that responsibility. In terms of holding them responsible for failures in nuclear security, you know, I think that would depend on being able to demonstrate criminal negligence, and you know, that that probably gets pretty hard. I think, you know, fundamentally, these leaders are political people, even the ones that aren't duly elected, um, and they're subject to political pressures constraining their ability by getting them to recognize that they have this responsibility, I think, would be... Well, the whole norm is to elevate it from the criminal <coughs> level to the political level, but the responsibility is not a matter of criminal things by making the connection, but rather politically he is accountable, he or she is accountable. Exactly. But the, the problem is, I mean, as I, I can envision this, just try to look at it from a, a non-nuclear weapon state perspective, uh, it, it would appear hypocritical for many countries if the P5 were to emphasize the importance of political responsibility for the security of civilian nuclear material <laughs> at the same time that they resist efforts uh, to delegitimize nuclear weapons. So uh, I don't think that's going to fly, uh, but uh, okay. I, I don't, I'm not, I, w I wish we could elevate the importance of individual, you know, presidential prime ministerial responsibility, but to do so for one category of missile material while excluding 
uh, another category seems to me. You know, but I'm not uh, arguing for excluding that category. I would say that yeah. the leaders have an undelegatable responsibility for the security of all weapons, usable material, or weapons within their territory. Yeah. Any kind of accident, for example. Well, I would say so. Safety and security are related issues. My main concern is security. Uh, but if we could wrap safety in there as well, I, I wouldn't oppose it. Okay. Well, we've covered a lot of territory, Will. This was a really uh, you know, fascinating discussion. I'm very grateful for you having uh, uh, come here, raised these issues, and I think this is a, an issue that we will return to, uh, perhaps after the uh, uh, ministerial meeting on nuclear security that the agency, IAE, will hold uh, this December. So uh, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking thank our speaker.